Thank you very much, especially the organizers for inviting me here. I'm an imposter. I come from the University of Johannesburg, so I'm not from the Western Cape. And I want to talk a little bit about this sort of education intervention we're trying to do. I've got 16 slides in five minutes, so I'm going to, it's going to be a whirlwind tour. Uh, it's called the UJ Methods Lab, and it's essentially going to be a place a bit like this forum over here. And this is why we've got common ground and uh, we are collaborating for us to stay up to date, to learn, to reach out, to, to communicate our, our work. It's essentially going to be a, a, a forum uh, online for us to learn new technologies in methods. And the, as you've just sat, sat over here, there's so many. You'll see over here we used the, the artwork over here is produced by Dali. So we learned how to prime Dali to, to produce the art. So these methods are emerging all the time. They're around us. And how can we utilize them and integrate them into our work? And that's really what the UJ Methods Lab is going to, is going to do. So we're going to be a network. Part of our work is to build a pan-African network of people in the digital sciences and humanities, researchers, academics, students, etc. We're going to have an archive and a broadcasting infrastructure, and then we're going to produce a curriculum that we communicate via um, online training, but we'll also be able to micro-credentialize the, the resources over time. Okay, well, so it's really about capacity development. Uh, taking all this new technology and making it applicable, training the students, the next generation of students to take this technology and make it applicable to um, the, 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 the work context, to the, to the economy, to, to development, social development. Why is it important in Africa? Well, you can see <clears throat> where we positioned here uh, globally in a whole lot of indicators, education indicators, science indicators. Africa produces 1% of the world's science. So that's just a very... Um, uh, and, and a lot of the problems got to do with education. What kind of methods? Is, uh, you know, methods courses. You get this textbook that comes from somewhere else that's from another age and uh, the lecturer, year after year, they reproduce the same type of methods that, have, that were fit and developed for another purpose, not for um, the, the type of digital futures that we are, is our reality. And you can see it just in terms of uh, research and development investment in Africa compared to other regions of the world. We are lagging behind. Uh, this is just uh, researchers in Africa versus other countries of, um, and other continents. We, are, are, we don't have the researchers. We have, we're not training the researchers. We're not training the, the next generation to, to uh, take the economy. Why is it important? Well, in 18 years' time, by 2040, 60% of young people on this planet that's under 21 are going to be in Africa. So if we don't train Africa, and I think that's the point of the quote in the next slide, science matters. Science matters. Science matters. It's important that we train young people in Africa in digital humanities, in other sciences, in a way that's accessible, that's usable, so that they can contribute to the global science project and to the development, not only of Africa, but everywhere else. You can just imagine, with 60% of the world's youth on this continent, we have to prepare for that and we have to develop the, the technologies and uh, education infrastructure that can do that. So now's the opportunity to act. So why is now a good time to do it? Well, there's uh, two major things that's happened, and the first is um, uh, the, 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 the digital networks in Africa are growing. So post-COVID, we've gone offline, so offline's become uh, much more available. There's massive investment, I'll show you in the next slide, massive investment in uh, IT infrastructure and communication infrastructure in Africa. For, it's happening now um, for the next three or four years. And it's really going to change the, the way in which Africans, young Africans, can access the internet and these other types of resources. So that's the one thing. There's infrastructure being developed. The second thing is open science, a lot of things we're talking about. So open science is happening, it's around us. So we've got 
open science, but how do we create open access to open science? And it's not that you, it's not there, it's that it requires cultural capital to access um, this open science that's there, and it requires an, a digital infrastructure. And so these conditions are now in place to, to change the way we do education and to, um, to, to try and achieve the, the dissemination of these technologies outside of these rooms where we are, but into the population more broadly. And into education programs, into the first year methods course at your university. And there's just some uh, uh, facts and figures about um, the, the way in which the, the investment that's actually happening and the access to the internet that, um, uh, for example, it's from 2025, uh, 20, 20, uh, 65% of people in Africa will access the internet. That's incredible, and that's an, a massive uh, achievement. And it's speeding up, this is speeding up. So very soon, um, these technologies are gonna be available to, to people in general. So what are we trying to, um, to, to teach? So we're developing a, a youth value driven model. There's a little slogan where we want to target uh, young people and um, equip them with skills. Like for example, like just what I'm talking about here, how do you prime Dolly? How do you use this piece of AI technology to produce images that you can use in, in, in presentations and other things like that? But there's, there's, these new technologies are developing all the time and there's always new skills that are, are required for all of us. Uh, so, um, so it's computational methods, our main focus on computational methods, but not only because as we saw this morning, when you have these computational methods, you also need qualitative methods to sometimes put your, your narrative, your theory, and these results that you get together. So um, the, the, the types of methods we're talking about here, we need a broad spectrum methods, but obviously with a focus on, on computational methods. And of course, this can feed into uh, the future economy. Very interesting, I don't know if any of you have seen the Berlin Declaration on Open, uh, on open Science. Our mission of disseminating knowledge is only half complete if the information not made widely accessible available to society. And I think that's true. It's one thing having open science, but it's another thing having closed access. So we need both open science and open access to that science. And the, the, the second says, a sentence of that um, uh, Berlin Declaration actually says that these new technologies, this new infrastructure might be a mechanism in a way in which we can open the access. So it's an opportunity for us for us because Africa has, you know, go to these international conferences and Africans aren't there. And by and large, because of economic and geographic barriers. And so there's possibilities now of transcending um, these barriers and creating open access and utilizing it on this continent. So at the moment, we're just a, a startup. Um, but uh, we're looking for partners. And then we're going to look for members. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the membership um, link at the moment. That's still coming in terms of our technology development. So we can do this together. And uh, there you can uh, join our, our Twitter uh, community. Or you can follow us on Twitter or you can go look at our, our website. So thank you very much for, for everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Kevin. Um, are there any questions? So initially this session was supposed to be a panel discussion, but after much consideration, um, the speakers will be giving lightning talks and then we'll wrap up the session at the end. Um, are there any questions, comments? Okay, yeah, Sean. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe Kevin, um, is there a way that people, besides joining um, uh, Twitter and, and so on, that they can maybe contribute to maybe methods that they already have worked on in terms of their environments? Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. Yes, we are looking for, so we're building two communities. One is a community of, of users or consumers, and we're all users as well. The other is a, a community of experts. So we are going to be looking uh, to this community over here 
for people that can do training in, um, in various, various methods. I think the best way at the moment to get hold of us is to follow us on, you can just look under the UJ Methods Lab. I think it's called the UJ Meth Lab, actually, or the, the Twitter <laughs> handle. Um, so you, you just look for us over there, you follow us on Twitter, and we'll, uh, that way we'll be able to uh, communicate as our uh, technology develops. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you so much, Kevin. So you heard that. Join the UJ Myth Lab. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And our um, next lightning speaker is Inonge Lupina. Let's please give her a hand as she comes to the podium. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to share my experience of pursuing a master's degree in e-science with a background of humanities and um, with a background of humanities and social sciences. Um, the MA e-science program is a program that aims to train postgraduates um, in the use of st st statistical methods to conduct data-driven research in the social sciences and humanities and creates opportunities for students to develop an interdisciplinary perspective on emerging fields of um, data science. So at the start of my academic journey, I never imagined myself pursuing a degree in e-science, let alone in technology. Um, I was always more drawn towards drama, psychology, criminology, and I truly believed that was where my passion lied. However, as I progressed in my studies, I realized that technology in relation to data analytics and research plays an incre increasingly important role in our society, and I really wanted to be part of that change. Um, the transition was definitely not easy. Um, I had no prior technical experience, um, and the idea of, of diving into a completely new field was daunting and very intimidating. I had to work extra hard, especially in a fast-paced environment, um, and, but throughout, I discovered that my background gave me a very unique perspective on the role of technology in society. I was able to criti critically think about the impact of technology on people and communities and how it could be used to address societal changes. Okay. Um, the rewards of exploring um, digital hum humanities have been immense. I was given the opportunity to learn a wide range of technical skills, including data analytics, programming, and machine learning. The experience sparked my passion for user experience design, or UX design, and the concept of designing user-friendly technology is something that really fascinates me. I discovered that my background in the humanities and social sciences gave me a unique set of skills that were critical to UX design, um, such as uh, empathy, creativity, and the ability to communicate complex ideas. So having said that, I'd really like to encourage you to explore the digital side of humanities. The world of technology is rapidly evolving, and um, there is a growing demand for individuals who can bring a unique perspective to the field. You have the potential to be a tremendous asset in the field, which should not only give you a competitive edge, but um, your diverse perspective can be, a, can be very important to, important to solving complex issues. I encourage you to take the leap, and you might just discover your own hidden passions and talents. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Inonge. Are there any questions for Inonge? Are we tired or are we just absorbing, you know, as trees that absorb nutrients from the ground, are we just, just on the absorbing phase of things? Yeah? Just absorbing. Just taking it all in. Okay. Thank you so much, Inonge. <laughs> Joining us online, um, Caroline Gase. Are we ready? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm sorry I'm not there in person, but it's been lovely joining um, from this side of the world. I'm in Cape Town. Um, I'm Carolyn Keith. I am a graduate from Stellenbosch University, where I did 
my BA International Relations Political Science, my honors and masters, and then I got a position at the University of the Western Cape as a instructional designer. So coming from uh, also BA Humanities, um, like the previous speaker, and then coming into technology, not knowing exactly what I'm getting myself into, um, I literally stepped in. We started the, the Center of Technology or CIECT e-learning um, 18 years ago, 2005, and I've never left. So um, then starting in this position, basically, I, I've been an instructional designer. And what that entails is basically I connect with lecturers, um, project owners that want to go online and um, then assist them basically with designing and developing their online um, modules or academic um, journey. And then from the design and development, looking at a learning management system, um, we've worked with various um, platforms. Um, currently we use Sakai and um, we have a 99% adoption rate. Um, as you can see, we advise academics and professional support staff with, their, with regards to the pedagogical use of both content creation, assessment and communication e-tools. Um, from the start, we I would sit with a lecturer um, starting out what is it that they are teaching and then basically taking it online. And then as well, we, we started off with a blended approach and then COVID hit. Um, we all were hit with COVID in 2020. Then we fully went fully online. Um, yes, so we we assist, design, develop with lecturers, and then also take take the students um, on their journey as well. And then basically, yes, I don't know. Uh, let me go to my second slide. We as we um, design online short courses. We're thinking of those students, you know, the, the the dynamics are changing. We're not all able to fully come to campus or students are working from, they're already working or we have adults working and they want to join um, in the online environment. And then we need to think about the different uh, spaces we find ourselves in. So we've designed a short little short course um, it's called e -tools, an e-tools kit for entrepreneurs. It's at level NQF level five. Um, the link is um, accessible, which you can basically um, check out. And then, yes, I, I think I'll stop here. If there's any questions, um, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. So thank you so much, Caroline. Are there any questions? There is a question. Um, please stay on the line, Caroline. There's a question for you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Um, this is just from the virtual participants, so I think you'll already be aware of this. Uh, this is actually a comment to Kevin earlier, but I think it's it applies to uh, a lot of what we're doing. Um, okay. So it says, perhaps the consideration of exploring decolonizing the science and technology space. Um, I am rendering it exactly as the participants typed it here. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. Um, any comments on that? Any input? Any Anyone wants to respond to that or agree with that or speak to that? Oh, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. That's a critical issue because um, built into a lot of these archives and technologies is um, bias. Um, uh, and there's many examples of that. So someone was telling me just now, but uh, they asked uh, uh, ChatGDP to produce uh, an Afrikaans poem. And uh, the Afrikaans poem was uh, about the Karoo and it was a very sort of uh, stereotypical 
representation of Afrikaans and Afrikaans language and Afrikaans people. So inside all of these um, models are uh, biases. And, you know, we've come through a whole history of having information given to us via the textbook. I think the textbook is the great evil because that was the instrument by which the colonization happened. And uh, we've got a new opportunity now to, to make knowledge differently and to collaborate, to have a genuinely collaborative knowledge that's actually inclusive. And I think that some of the transition to um, different forms of communication and interaction, global forms, uh, give, provide opportunities for us to do things a little bit differently. Mm, thank you so much, Kevin. All right, any other comments, questions? Okay, in the absence of any, I will call on, a, on our last lightning speaker for this, nope, second last lightning speaker for the session, Samuel Wickham. And um, we're just going to give him a moment to set up because he will actually be showing us his work. He brought a few um, visual aids. I don't know how humanities people call it. He brought stuff in the... <laughs> he brought some stuff. And um, are we ready? Yeah, we can go. Okay. So my name is Samuel, and I'm just a normal lecturer at CPUT. I teach uh, boring drawing to first and second year uh, level graphic design students. So the reason why I'm here today is to actually link with what um, Dr. Is it Hillary? What, what you said about the process. So this whole graph is about my process and this is about my process. And within that process, they struggle. Struggle to accept dominating technology, approaching, coming all around us and Am I ready to accept? Am I ready to learn? And I've encapsulated my entire process from being biased, subjective, to moving on to an objective viewpoint. And this is basically a visual way of my struggle. Right? And if you look at the headings on top, there's a symbol, there's a symbol, real symbol. And my process uh, spans over just about three and a half years. And in the beginning, in 2020, I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna put down my feelings in a series of sketchbooks. And something told me to buy five sketchbooks. I didn't know why. I only figured it out last, I think, two months ago, why I bought five sketchbooks. And the reason was, it's a metaphor for a thesis. So I have an introduction, a literature review, methodology, discussion, and a conclusion. And all those five books is encapsulated in the one, the one book, which I will go through. Um, if we look at the first book, you can see my drawings is kind of loose. There's no real structure. And as, a, as I go through my phases, I'm working out. You can see here, it's portrait, then there's a landscape. And as I move along, then it's, there's a gap there, there's negative space, positive space. And, um, I'm trying to find, even my subject matter is, 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 yet, uh, is, not, is not fixed, okay? Right? And as I move along, I'm still finding my way, I'm still intro introducing myself to what I want. Not yet there, then this way, then I start flowing. And as I go along, my, my technique also refines and it, is, it improves, right? Okay, and if you notice that book has a lot of drawings, and this book doesn't, because here I started to question my whole process because the effort it took to come up with these drawings. Um, right, that's that one. This is a, a literature review, then I get to the method. Here I started to come undone, you can see how the book look unfinished. <laughs> I really, I really um, couldn't foresee myself drawing this detailed over a long extended period, and it's even unfinished. I just, I just couldn't care. Then, if you look, if, can I, can I see the, the slide quickly? If you looked by, so the, the three books is 2022. 
I don't know if you can see that, right? Then in, from 2022 to the end, from 2021 to the end of 22, there's two more books. So from this three to this two, there's a whole other series of drawings that are happening. And it goes from large to smaller, 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 to almost minuscule, to stamp size. And then I go back to the books. And in those books, I uh, finally decided I need to find a way, and I couldn't draw like that anymore. So I went to a more free, easier way, as you can see. Right? And then I developed a little bit further by going more free. That is, this is mid last year, and that's it. I stopped drawing here. Okay, so what I'm saying is, you must understand, for someone who has been drawing almost his whole life, and the accepted standard is to draw as realistic as possible, for me to change my style from that to that, it took a lot. And then afterwards I realized I'm trying to critique or talk about the tension that I'm feeling. Remember, I'm from the old world, where craft is very important, and now I'm part of the new world, where it's not so important, because now anybody can do basically what anyone else do, does, but obviously there's varying degrees. Okay, so I realized that's the issue. Then I decided I'm actually gonna make a thesis based on these books. I'm gonna page through them. So the first opening page is the abstract, and then I have a glossary of terms, appendix, and this is my chapters, which is those books. So chapter one introduction, I printed that out and cut that out, and we go along like that. And chapter one. So all the drawings in chapter one goes down like this. And if you notice here, yeah, I've, I've started to write. Remember, this is a work in progress. So I've started to write, but it's not legible to no one. It's, it's kind of like a, 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 a Sanskrit. Not as holy as that, but to me it's holy. <laughs> and like I said, it's not supposed to be legible. And as I go through the book, as I go through the phases, my, my, it will become messier, even more illegible, but further, the deeper I go, it will become legible and more understandable, right? And you can see, so all of this I will fall still. And when it's, when it's here, I'm gonna have an analysis and summary, and I will graph, um, I will plot using thread, I will work with it like that, how I, I um, went through the various processes. And I also have a reference, a reference list right at the end, which is all my references, I've kept everyone through the three years, right? That's that. And then I go here, and this is the one I want to show you. So, if you can see, I've, I've worked at a, with a, a very, very specific type of, um, it was only portraits. And in the first book, it's Caucasian, and from there onwards, it's African. I didn't know why, but, Last week, I think, I, th I thought about it, um, and it might be because the Eurocentric um, facial structure is the accepted norm. That's, I mean, that's what I grew up on, Da Vinci, and what, I'm out of time. Sorry? Oh, okay, 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 well, okay. <laughs> so, so, so there's this, this one more thing before I'm done. One more thing, and that is the crux of this, of this whole talk, is I've never touched any technological tool, no text-to-image art generator, nothing, until last week. And this is the image I created, this single image, that's it. And now if I look at that image, I was astounded because it took me three seconds. Normally a drawing takes me one week to one month. Three sentences, I didn't think about it, and it mimics exactly what I've done. But I've realized that this book has a weight, and the weight is seven pounds. Who knows what the significance of seven pounds? That is the weight of a human soul, apparently. So this book has my soul. Whereas the AI generated does not. So, yeah, all I want to say is, now I'm ready to move on to technology, but it took me three years to make that transition internally and to, and to be okay with it. So, yeah, and that's why I teach drawing. 
because I didn't want to deal with this. But now to start to these other subjects. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, are there any questions? Are we all feeling all philosophical, want to go have some time with our inner selves? Masi? Thank you for your beautiful presentation. Are you planning on digitizing those? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. All of this is going nowhere. This is, this is the first time I'm talking about it to a public audience. I've never done it. And uh, I have to be honest, I was very, very nervous. I actually looked for excuses to not do it. And then she said, no, no, that's not how it works. We'll, we'll figure out something for you. That is why all of this is happening. So no, I'm not. But this, OK, I'm, I'm also registered for, for a, a, a doctorate. But I haven't done nothing except this. But now I'm ready to do it. But this is not my thesis. This is all for me, for my understanding. So no, I won't be digitizing this. It will only be, I will only talk about it face to face. I mean, he did say it carries his soul, right? So, you see, so he, he wouldn't want to, whew. Um, I just first want to say uh, thank you for, for being so courageous uh, to share it with us. Um, it is tough. <laughs> um, I, you just actually answered my question. I was wondering if uh, this, this process uh, will be part of uh, a study, because uh, I mean, it, it sounds like very rich material to be part of a postgrad study of sorts. Is it going to be part of your, your PhD? That I want to know. And then one, one thing I did not understand is your, um, that transition between the the, the hand um, drawing to the digital move, that move to the digital humanities. Can you re-explain that? I, I, I didn't understand that transition until lo which the, the thing you made last week. OK, first, first question. But this is everything to my, my doctoral studies, to me. But it's going to be nothing to, any, to the audience because I'm not going to share it. Um, and your second question is, it took me just about three years to stop doing craft and to do that one AI-generated image. And you can see my process starts in the first book, detailed drawings. And as I'm going along, I'm stripping away, I'm stripping away. But I'm also stripping away what I am inside. But it took all of those two and a half years to be able to actually um, register to open AI and to generate an image. Does that answer your question? Or does it confuse you more? No, but I do think those two and a half years must be part of your thesis. Because, I mean, getting to that image is not, it's not, doesn't fall out of the air. So you say it's not for, for us, it's only for yourself, but that's it's, not true. For now, it's, I mean, it's obviously for everyone. But okay, I'm but not. I'm not willing to. That, I'm not that? willing to publish it. Oh. But you, no, you can't. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can, but I'll can, stop. Can, can we we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, Samuel, just during the networking session, yeah. just know that um, you will have a lot of people around you. Uh, we're going to hear from the online participants. Um, I think this actually sums up everyone's feelings um, from Carolyn. Uh, this is phenomenal. Would love to see the end product, Samuel. I think she said that earlier in your presentation. You have great skills. Then she says, thank you. And just all caps, wow, wow, wow. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you. OK, um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you, your presentation in terms of uh, your fashion sense as well. Okay. Um, it's, it's quite astonishing. I mean, everything is well thought of. It's well thought through. Um, and and uh, if, if we are not able to share the product of the two years, maybe you can share the process of the two years. And you can also share maybe uh, um, uh, your, your reflections uh, of the different points of the transition and say, uh, this is how I felt at this point. This is what I feel. This is what I feel. 
I have a conclusion on this, I don't have a conclusion on that, that is open, that is closed, and so on. So uh, I think that that would be very nice if um, we, we, we could get a, a gift from you in that fashion, the process. And then the last one is, um, uh, when you do your actual PhD, would you be interested in collaborating with somebody on a study that they are doing that has got nothing to do with art and try to represent that study in an art format? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. Appreciate it. Um, the, the reflections will be my doctoral studies. So I'm writing autoethnography so that it will all be there. So this is not my thesis, it's just the visual format, but all of those will live in the thesis. And of course, you're welcome to, is it for yourself or someone else? <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine, thank you, sir. All right. then. Thank you so much, yeah. Samuel. Yeah. I'm so glad I did not want to budge when you tried to, to get out of this presentation. Um, and just thoughts from me is that, you know, we talk about digital humanities, digitizing your work, making work open. And I think for the first time in this conference, or also in a long time, I'm like, actually, do we stop to say, how do you feel about digitizing your work? I don't think we do. We just say, why are you still using Microsoft Word? Why are you still using, let me not mention tools, but why are you still using that tool? Why don't you, you know, get on with the times? But I think today this opened my eyes to say, but what is it? What does it mean to you? Um, yeah, so our last light lightning speaker for this session is Frances. May we please give her a hand as she comes to the podium. Sorry, I might be a little nervous. I don't actually often talk in front of a crowd. <laughs> um, so my name's Francis uh, gillis Weber. I'm currently fourth year PhD student in the computer science department at UCT. And my supervisor is Tommy Mayer. Go to the next slide. No? <laughs> do, can, do, I, do I press? Oh, sorry. <laughs> do I press? OK. So, um, so I started out, um, actually I've uh, been in industry for the longest time, as I was a web developer. Uh, as a personal passion project, I just started digitizing uh, books that were South African um, authors that were in the public domain and just making them available online. Um, I, my main focus actually was Sol Plaiki. Um, I really, really loved his works. Um, as part of that, uh, Coursera at that time was really big in the, in the media and, and a big new thing, which is massively open online courses, a MOOC. So I actually thought a metadata MOOC would be a really good idea. And um, you can see the little map, just the distribution of all the participants in that MOOC. And South Africa is number 27, and I was one of those. So really loved the MOOC. And what I learned in there was actually something about semantic web, and I was like, ooh, I'm a web developer, but this is the first time I'm hearing about semantic web and web 3.0, and I actually knew nothing about it. So I was very intrigued, and um, I started to explore a little bit more and just go a little bit more in depth. And if anybody knows about anything about semantic web, like that was the original like stack, and it was all very, got very complex, very overwhelming, very quickly. So I took another MOOC, uh, this time offered by OpenHPI, uh, also just on learning semantic web technologies. And I actually, I, I love textbooks. I actually also really love hard copy books. So I made use, I was living in Stellenbosch at the time, so I made use of, my, of the Stellenbosch University Library. It was accessible to the general public. And so I went there a lot, just to go and read up on the books that they had on semantic web. Then, um, just another, uh, so maybe just a quick definition of semantic web. It's uh, data that's online, web accessible. Uh, the idea is to uh, share it and make it machine operable, not, so it doesn't just rely on humans to interpret. Um, there's very many technologies involved as part of it. And, um, but I always just, I, I focused originally on linked data. Then, um, 
My next big milestone that I did is I actually started a master's at UCT in the library studies department, which has since become a DECUS. And I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly. <laughs> and um, it was a digital curation master's, and it was really great because what it did is um, it was pretty much uh, highly interdisciplinary, but also just allowed me to lean more into the technical aspects of the coursework if I wanted to. Which, so what I did with all my assignments is I tried to focus on the more sem semantic web elements where possible. And then from that, I actually, I did my dissertation then. Um, I digitized a, a small dictionary. Um, it was an English course dictionary um, from the early 1900s that was in the public domain and the small medical dictionary. And at the time, I was um, actually in this really major state of flux trying to work out what type of uh, language model I should use to digitize. And um, I think in the literature at the time, there was the whole, all the language models were in flux as well. So, for example, uh, lexical markup framework was still featuring in the literature. There was text encoding um, initiative, which the terminal wasn't really suitable. Schema.org came up with, should I use SCOS? Should I use um, RDF? Yeah, are they the same thing? <laughs> and then it was also Ontelex Lemon, LexInfo, etc. I really didn't know which model I, had to, uh, I should choose. So actually, um, I came across uh, a summer school that was um, held in Spain, we got some, managed to get some sponsorship for that. And um, I went for a week and it was probably the, the, probably the best experience I've actually had in terms of summer schools and that kind of thing. I made some friends that were at other participants who are in academia and who I've since still stayed in touch with. But actually what it did is it gave me all access to all their materials and their lecture materials and their code examples that probably for the next six months I referred to. And I just don't think my, my dissertation would have been I wouldn't have managed what I did uh, without that. It was, it was a huge help. Then once I finished my master's and I now moved on to the PhD, this time I changed my focus. It was no longer linked, linguistic linked data, still within semantic web, but now multilingual aisle ontologies. And um, actually I used a textbook that's also been, been published by a researcher in UCT in computer science department, which is an introduction to ontology engineering. And that just really helped me navigate my topic and understand a little bit more. And I'm done anyway, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you, I got the yellow card. <laughs> so anyway, that, that, so that, that's it. I was asked to just give a talk on the tools and resources I used. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions, any comments? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks. I was just wondering, uh, how do you intend to apply everything which you learned? Like, uh, I'm not intending to apply. Uh, it's just uh, right now I'm, um, right, right now what I'm working on is looking at how to uh, well, so you have an aisle ontology, so it's just, uh, um, data rep um, represented, and the idea is that you're supposed to make it multilingual, and you just do labels, but there's no one-to-one -one mapping between the labels, so how do you, how do you change that so that it actually re accurately reflects the language? And what I'm actually just doing is looking at a method where you, take, you change only the bits that are different, and you just use an algorithm and then generate a new ontology. And so that, that's a plan, that's a process, but actually no intention for application. It will just be published and then I'll move on to the next topic, <laughs> something else that interests me. I think there are a lot of people in the uh, digital humanities um, environment which can use your skills, I'm just saying. <laughs> Conversations for networking session. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you so much, Thanks. Francis. Well, please give her a hand. Um, before we wrap up, I'm just going to call Prof. Kevin to wrap up the session. So thanks to all the speakers. Hasn't it been interesting looking at the different applications of digital humanities across the course of the day? It's been fascinating. So I think all the um, presenters need a, a round of applause, and the, and the organizers uh, too.
It's fantastic that we've got an event like this where we can come together across different disciplines and different applications and just listen to each other, isn't it? So there's, I, I think just uh, over, especially this last session over here, there, there, there are three things that stick out. One is the application of digital humanities and we just see in all these different examples and we see how powerful it is and there's almost an imperative there to embrace it. Um, the second uh, feature that comes out is learning. We all need to learn new things because it's growing so quickly, it's so diverse, etc. And the third thing that's come up in this last session as well is about resistance and there's concerns. And I think it's just those three things we might just bear in mind as we, as we go forward because resistance is important. It's important to creativity and it's important to ensuring that we don't make and repeat the mistakes of the past. So, and I think Samuel's talk really um, demonstrated some of the value of resistance for uh, creative outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. We have come to the end of, well, almost the end of day one. I'm gonna call on Professor Meno. I'm not very good with surnames. Prof Meno to come and wrap up the day. And then we're going to go have our networking session. Oh, there will be announcements before we go to the networking session. Thank you, Prof. Are these the announcements that I just received? Oh, we'll see, we'll see. Thank you. Um, so I've been asked to wrap up. And actually yesterday I asked, so what exactly, uh, what exactly does that mean? What do I need to do really? Um, and to be honest, now I'm standing here, I know even less. Uh, <laughs> So it, it's not that I don't know what wrapping up means, but I mean, seeing, seeing what, the day, what the day has been, um, I don't know where to start. It's, there's so much. How can you kind of try to, to, to get that together and make it into a coherent story? Um, I, I'll try my best, but <laughs> I, I, I think that's actually very difficult. So let me just do this chronologically and then I'll just add a few things um, at least the things that, that, that um, stood out for me, and then I'd like to hear what you, uh, what you think as well. Um, so I almost forgot, but we started out with these icebreakers, this bingo. Did people like that? Did, who, who met some new people? I did. Everybody? Okay, so at least that part is, is sorted. That was good. Um, and then we talked about trees. <laughs> okay. Um, we got some information on the Escalator project, and then we had the big vision uh, by Prof. Justus. That was, I think, very nice to have as a good start, as a basis. You know, what are we really talking about? Um, I, I missed a little bit of what John presented right at the beginning, the, the, the practical things, but I realized there's, there are actually two boards in this room. Uh, there might be more boards, but I know at least there are two boards, and they're over there the jargon wall and the job board. And I'm specifically interested in the jargon board or the jargon, jargon wall it's called because I thought there will be a lot of terminology that we don't actually know about and that people have questioned. The idea was I think that we'd write down that jargon so we can, we can tackle that. I think it's completely empty. So I'm now not sure if people if I misunderstood, if people misunderstood, or if we all know what we're talking about. Um, so don't all run to the jargon wall now. Uh, but if you, if you have terms where you think, okay, I don't actually know what this means, please do write that down. Uh, but that actually made me think about um, something else as well. And people have asked me this before. So I'm a professor in digital humanities, and then people ask me, so what exactly is digital humanities? And I actually don't know. <laughs> um, and I tell them, look, that's, that's, I think that's fine because we can, we can sort this out together. And I think that's also what we've seen uh, today. I mean, we've seen so many presentations, so many different topics. Um, I still don't know exactly what digital humanities is, but I, I think all of what I've seen kind of fits in what, what I believe digital humanities can be. Um, we've seen a lot of... In very interesting presentations. Um, I'm not going to, to mention all of them because you were here as well. Um, social networks and networking, I really like that as well. That's also what I'm interested in. We saw some information on um, the community of practice that we're trying to build. Uh, we also had lunch, which was good. 
Um, <laughs> then we had a presentation on, on what data means, and I thought it was interesting as well because you, we're using the words or the term data, and yeah, yeah, we know what data is, but then if we really think about it, do we really know what data is? I mean, Benito, you really tried, tried getting that information from the audience. I don't know. I don't know what data is. I mean, I've got some ideas, but again, you know, we're, we're using these terms, but it's kind of open and it depends on your background exactly what it is. So I think it's wonderful that we can just sit down and have people together here from different areas and then think about what does this really mean? Because it might mean something different from, uh, for you than from somebody else. Um, what else did we have? We had lightning talks. That's really nice because you see a whole range of topics in a quick uh, succession, a whole range of different topics. Um, and then, of course, we had more lightning talks just now. Uh, I think mostly on the importance of the age. Um, and, and Kevin, I really liked your presentation because I really think it is important and it will, it will bring us much if we, if we seriously tackle this. And I think it's fine if we don't know exactly what DH is. If you think you're doing DH, I think you're doing fine, right? We can, we can do this together. Um, so I've heard some interesting questions, uh, interesting discussions, not just during the sessions, but also outside. Uh, during coffee break, during lunch. Uh, I think that was really nice. Uh, the presentations, I think, were very interesting in the sense of some were quite abstract and some were extremely concrete, like I'm doing exactly this. Uh, I really, really like that. Topics on, uh, and I, I probably missed a few topics as well, but on archiving, on language, on art, on processes, on sociology, on history, on learning, on the different methods. Um, okay, so this is exactly what I mean. How do I wrap all of that up in one coherent story? I don't, you know, it's so broad. Um, I also really liked, uh, I'm pointing to Kevin again, the, the three terms that you just mentioned, applications, learning, and concerns. I think perhaps that actually wraps it up, and you did the wrapping up for me already, <laughs> which is nice. Um, no, but I think we, I, I mean, I learned a lot today. Uh, I've seen a lot of different things, and I think we're doing a lot of different things that people would call digital humanities already. Uh, we just need to share this, right? We need to talk to other people, share the, the things you're doing, and, and see where we can do more, more research. Um, so one thing I really, really like, by the way, uh, has nothing to do with the actual content, but that we have in-person meeting, that we're actually here meeting people um, being online, having online conferences is nice, you get the academic content, but what's missing as well is the interactions during the coffee break. Actually talking to people, not necessarily about your work or your presentation, but just, hey, what are you interested in? Hey, what are you doing? But I, I think that is, that is really great, so we can have that as well. Um, and I think that's important because a digital humanities, at least to me, is inherently interdisciplinary. So I can do the work that I feel comfortable with in my comfort zone. But if I start collaborating with somebody who's kind of outside my comfort zone, we can actually do something together by you know, combining our skills and combining our knowledge. And I think that is something that we're trying to do with the DH Ignite event. We try to bring people together. Uh, that's also why there are people from different universities here. So sometimes you just need to kind of step out of your comfort zone university uh, and look at what other people are doing. Um, so please keep that in mind. There will be a networking session after this, right? Um, so make use of that. Make use of the fact that we're here in person. Make use of the fact that there are people kind of not working exactly in your field, but fields that might be directly related and try to make use of that. Try to see where new collaborations might, uh, might happen, that we can bring something new. We can really build the field because DH is, at the moment, still very uh, young in South Africa. Um, I did get some notes, just before, but that was only online. Um, just a few, few practical notes before we really start the networking part. If you did not sign the attendance register this morning, 
Anybody? Okay, you don't have to put your hand up. You can just go and <laughs> still sign that register. <laughs> it's all fine. Um, if you didn't choose a workshop, on Friday we have two workshops. So if you didn't choose a workshop yet, please do that as well. Um, please see Knox before you leave. Um, so the workshops will be on Friday, in person only. So it won't be virtual for those people attending virtually now. Unfortunately, these are in-person workshops. Um, and if you want to give something like an interview on DH Ignite, please see Knox uh, and Norma sitting there in the back before you leave. Um, yes, yeah, so this was my attempt to try and, and wrap things up. Like I said in the beginning, I find it very difficult simply because it's so, so broad. Um, and I really had to mentally go over the day, you know, what did I hear, what did I see? Um, I hope that helped for you as well to get a sense of what it was. I hope this was useful. Uh, not just me trying to do this, but I mean this whole day. Um, we have another day tomorrow. I hope it will be as useful, at least for me. I hope it will be as useful for you as well. And then there are workshops on Friday. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Benito. I feel like I've said many words. OK, everyone, I do not have the pep in my step like Knox does. I'm more of an older person, sorry. But um, you'll see, to start after networking sessions, there should be an A5 paper with um, in the middle of the table, and there are different leaves as well. Um, and if you're maybe at the table with not a lot of people, I think you can move or just interact with the table close by. And there's a few questions that sh just to start off the networking session um, that um, specifies the type of leaves that should discuss the questions. But you can really choose any of them. Um, hopefully, there's an interesting one you see you want to discuss and if you want to share more broadly you are also welcome.